Hi there, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's joining this session today. Um, my name is Pru Chung from the East West Management Institute's Open Development Initiative, and we'll be talking today about data and Indigenous peoples. And we have a great lineup of three speakers that uh, will talk about their experiences on Indigenous data and knowledge systems. And so um, after each presentation, I would like to open up the floor for Q&A or um, any questions that you have for the, that particular speaker. And then we'll also have, um, we'll also have a, a, a general discussion at the end. Um, so please feel free to open up um, your mic as well and join us on stage and ask your question directly or enter it into the chat or Q&A. So, Firstly, I would like to introduce Pirawan. Pirawan is a Karen Indigenous woman based in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and she works with the Asian Indigenous Peoples Act, uh, Pact. Pirawan, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Um, I would like to share about how we develop our protection mechanism for our knowledge and data in Asia. So maybe I will give some background about our indigenous people situation in Asia first, like uh, two thirds of the indigenous people uh, living in Asia. And we are like having the highly diverse ecosystem, culture, way of life and distinct uh, language and customly uh, governance system. In uh, ASEAN government except uh, Bangladesh voted uh, the adoption of the UN DREAM or United National Decla uh, Nation De Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People uh, in the General Assembly in 2007. However, uh, only uh, five ASEAN countries uh, to name uh, is uh, Philippines, Nepal, Cambodia, Japan, and Taiwan that have uh, officially used the term of Indigenous People. And how to say, uh, lack of recognition is really huge impact to us now as Indigenous people because uh, uh, it's blocking us to enjoy our basic right and also to assert our rights. And in the worst uh, scenario is uh, our people are facing different form of human rights violation of, and that is uh, physically uh, attacked and uh, I think additionally is also in the digital time is the digital threat that also uh, threatening the indigenous people. Regarding to our data and knowledge, uh, the outsider people exploited uh, our knowledge and they misuse, misinterpret, uh, pirate, and also com commercialize our knowledge for their own benefit and without uh, any uh, without our consent and also any benefit sharing to the people who are holding or own the knowledge. No? And this also had less to the loss of our culture and knowledge and uh, why we, we still being uh, discriminated and marginalized. Indigenous people like uh, in the world, like globally, we compose like 6% of the global population, but we are account for the 19% of the extinct poor. So if you are imagine to buy the phone or access to the internet, it's very challenging. So in the time of the internet and digital world like this, we are really uh, have the limited capacity to have the special skill on this thing. So, and we also access to this technology gadget and internet is really challenging because we live in the far area and our economy also, as I mentioned, like is not in the situ uh, in the state that we can access to those things easily. And apart from that, beyond that, some of our government uh, state also limit us to access to the information because we do not speak only uh, how to say uh, we do not understand the mainstream language or national uh, language only. Now we have our own language, so to access the information the information only share in one language like English or in the national language. So the people are not able to access to the important information. Therefore, uh, our indigenous people in Asia, we, we come together and thinking out like, how to do we to, how to say, 
to cope with this or to fight back with this? How, what will be our uh, tool to helping us to overcome this thing? You know? So in the world, uh, APP as the indigenous people movement uh, organization in Asia, we took lead with the support or uh, the work from uh, support from the ODI organization. We are work together and this is the first time like, we really come together and discuss about how to develop the framework that can protect our knowledge and data. So from that, we, we start the work since last year uh, by uh, conducting the survey first and uh, asking the question related to knowledge and data from our focal members. And then uh, we, we conducted during the COVID time. So the first two virtual consultations we conducted uh, and to develop the tool during that time with the eight countries now from our, our member. And then uh, we come up with the indigenous data similarity first. And in, on, in those, uh, the framework, we have the principle called wise principle, but because it's really technical and academic. So that's why the wise principle uh, was not really widely accepted by our uh, indigenous uh, brother and sister. That's why uh, this, yeah. Uh, in June, we have able to meet in person and uh, we able to discuss about the framework again together. And then we decided to revise the, the framework of the indigenous data severity to the indigenous data knowledge uh, severity uh, in, in June. And then uh, we revised this again. Lately, in October this year, we have come up with the uh, new uh how to say a revision of the framework where the is more simplified and easy uh, to understand to, uh, for the people to digest so we did the late uh, last consultation on the 8th october this year and we have come up with the framework and we adopted uh, the framework uh, which has changed the name to indigenous knowledge and data sovereignty framework so this framework will be like uh the tool that to guide us uh, in asserting our uh, asserting and defending our indigenous people inherent rights not to complete the rights and ownership over the data and the data that about us based on our value system so in in this framework we have uh, the key principle that considering the first one is about the governance and authority where the center is the people decision so we are the one who decide who manage this data and even though our representative have to come from the people that we know and we endorse them like uh, it will be the collective to to represent anyone uh, the selection of the person also come from our governance system and uh, this one also in terms of to decide the data or to collect the data also should based on our priority and to work on it. No? And the information and everything, this framework is like a living document. It should be flexible and can be changed based on the time because the world is keep changing. So there may be the new trends on this situation that we have to review together. But most importantly for this one, we really focus on the consent. So, uh, free prior informed and consent that is the principle that is really needed and this is our, our, our part of the self-determination right no so in the final whether to say yes or no it should be us who decide together no there should not be any like manipulate or like forcing us to decide on it and the fpic is take the process it's just not one time uh a process now that done but it's require the time and process consultation number of consultation and the people should have the full information before deciding to say yes or no in anything related to our knowledge and data the second principle is about ethic no so uh, this one we really res uh, have to people have to respect respect our rights respect our culture respect our value and the worldview like the way we see things is not like individually no and we also see things like Nothing is hierarchy, but everyone uh, equally. So we respect each other, not only as a human, but the nature and the non-living thing and the spirit, sure or not, are all, all the related. And the guardianship that we have to have the responsibility together to take care of this knowledge. No? And when the time, uh, another part is when there are dispute resolution, uh, the resource, uh, 
reconciliation that also based on our belief and system we uh have said when we have the conflict in the community we will not like uh, to make to hurt each other but we have to find a way how the community can reconcile and remain peaceful no? among our uh, indigenous group and uh, other clan or the neighbor community so we make sure that the balance is keep going not likely to look into the legal system that we really uh, by the juridistic that thing which is uh, that is another step that uh, for the state and law and regulation. But indigenous people themselves, we will find the resolution and reconciliation in our own way. In terms of the obligation, we are more focused on the state. What are the state need to need to do as a duty barrier? So uh, we uh, they should uh, how to say. Uh, imply with the international law where they have uh, agree or ratify to recognize our indigenous people right they they have to protect and respect our rights and also uh, ensure that there will be necessary support to uh, our indigenous people development and uh, they also has the set uh, responsibility to ensure that whatever information indigenous people will have the over control of that and so we can reclaim back our uh, authority over the knowledge that impact us and about us no the last uh, principle is on collective asset and benefit so this thing we not see like uh, for the money or anything but what we see is more like what will be the collective common goods for everyone in the community and uh, the community either individually or uh, how to say the collectively is the principle of sharing it's not really for the commercial or the way we see it. How to make sure that our people and the community uh, can live in and also uh, asset and sharing this benefit together. No? Like when we have, like just keep as simple, if we have the land, we not consider that is it yours or mine, but how to make sure that people who cannot access or in the uh, lower, uh, how to say, capacity, they can able access to the resources together no? so equally we take care of each other we're not thinking uh the benefit of individually as the as the basis no so these are the key principle that we put in the framework for our uh, framework right now to protect and to taking care of our data yeah thank you thanks pirawan that was a very quick rundown and there is a question in the q a um let me just bring it up again sorry, um, from, from Petri. He asks, um, he says that this is an important topic. Are there specific tools you or other communities need, that vol uh, need volunteers for, such as the open source community that could help to create, um, I, I'm assuming create data governance and management systems? Um, Uh, I think in the technical part, those things we are not really, uh, say, expert or familiar yet. No? That's why we also partnership with ODI, that bringing the technical part in the, how to say, the digital and the really, I don't know, like the technical thing. That, that's why we need a partnership on this no? to strengthen uh, our capacity. That's why I say like one of our, uh, how to say, gap. Is, is the knowledge and the, on the specific technical things. That's why the gadget, the tool, and all, all the domain information, the open source, those things are really threatening to us. And we, we need to learn and know more and yeah, produce some tool that can protect us. There are some technology that we are using for protecting our information and that of try to collect our data already. Some uh, kind of free tools, not like the MapBO or the those are for collect data on our land and resources for the people they know and collect it to protect the, that level that we already uh, have been doing. But we uh, maybe require more to learn and building this capacity to more people because this is just started from the small group, but the wider group need to know and learn more. Yeah. So that, that segues, so I would say that's an affirmative that there needs to be more work um, contributed to the technology sector to support Indigenous ways of 
thinking about technology, but on, and the data and data governing systems that respect Indigenous cultures and um, and worldviews. And so I think there is definitely scope and room to expand that. The second question here is uh, defining what Indigenous data is. And I think the, the Indigenous knowledge and data sovereign principles actually clearly define that. Um, Pirawan, do you want to share that definition? Yeah. Uh, that is a really good point. Uh, we actually we have simplified it uh, in the term like those is cover uh, the knowledge that uh, we produce and we in our land and territory. You now that 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 what we put. Uh, so there are a long this definition, but what what to explain to you like the the knowledge that the Indigenous people in the our community we own and produce in our land and territory. So that is we consider as uh, our knowledge. Now, so indigenous data are the units and pieces of information, now symbol, character about indigenous people. That That is where we consider under the land, territory and resources of our people, our community level. I, I hope that that is explained. Yes, it's include yeah. land, territory, our belief, our culture, our language, no, tangible and not tangible. So mm. it's not always in the form of I don't know meta card or something like the digital world. Do you think our spiritual mm. part is also part of our you no? Know, yes, I I I heard very often from our indigenous colleagues that. Indigenous knowledge and data is data and knowledge about communities um, for themselves, but also to help inform others others around um, land and natural resources as well. And so it is very clearly defined in that document um, and I'm hoping that that will be shared shortly. Um, Next speaker is Juliana. Juliana is an independent journalist uh, based in Indonesia, and she works in the intersect between digital technologies and the impacts on, on that on communities. She also interfaces on a global and regional level in internet governance issues. Juliana, please. Okay, thank you, Piru, for the introduction. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. Uh, for my data to inviting me to present in the online conference. Basically, uh, I will talk about the data and indigenous people in West Java, well, in some fields in West Java, uh, a place where I I stay there for a while to doing the research about the data governance, uh, cybersecurity, and the community network. Uh, yeah. Oh, she's back. Yeah. You back? Yeah. Yes. Push this. Yeah. So my title is about the data governments uh, and sustainability learning from the indigenous community. Uh, okay. So this is the this is the object of my presentation. Is the is this, the name is Cipta Gelar Village. Uh, this is uh, Cipta Gelar is an indigenous community located in the deep forest of the Halimun Mountain uh, and the part of uh, Halimun and Salak Mountain National Park, located in West Java, in Java Islands. So for the people. Uh, I should explain first. So Indonesia has has many has many islands, uh, has many islands, and we uh, Java is one of the islands uh, when the, the village is located. Uh, okay, so. Uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, the, the, the story of the Kitaglar is about the 
uh, starting with the community network, uh, 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 small community network, uh, small internet connection. Juliana, sorry, we keep losing you. You can change your um, your streaming to low definition. Um, while we wait for Juliana, I think she's having an issue with her connection. Perhaps we can move on to Dixon. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, I'll so, um, yeah, well, well, Dixon is sharing a screen. Let me just introduce uh -huh. Dixon. He's yeah. um, he's the Personium Chief Evangelist and also SDG Nine Enabler at Fujitsu Limited and a board member of the My Data community. He's been working at the moment uh, with some of our partners actually across Asia to look at how child safety in indigenous communities can be supported. Thank you. So uh, I think- uh, um, So if someone could stop uh, Juliana's presentation then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, otherwise I couldn't start my sharing. But uh, before we can do that, um, I'll just go on. Um, the, the reason I, I uh, studying in interest in the, um, indigenous um, pe people and data it's um, um, initially I don't know this term at all but uh, when I met um, Peru in in Tokyo in 2019 we start to talk about this um, um, indigenous topics and then how personal data store or how personal data management can 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 help um, everyone in in, in, the, in that community so um, that, that's why um, Oops, so uh, I'll share the, the slide later. Uh, so that's why I find that um, with, with what we're doing in my data, uh, actually we have six different principles and every one of them can be applied to helping the uh, um, the community. So for example, um, ho hopefully you, you will be able to check the, uh, um, the my data declarations later on. And the first of the principle is um, it has to be human-centered control of personal data. So uh, it means uh, w whatever we do, we we can focus on the uh, oh, okay. oh, I can share the screen now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, hopefully you can see my screen. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yeah, so within these six principles, um, I, I I totally believe that um, uh, it can help out the um, indigenous people on on their data sovereignty. So the first one it's human centric control of personal data. Second one it's um, individual as the point of integration. So it means um, we put everyone in, in concern to be human and, and uh, they will be the center of the control of the data. And then um, besides that, we have individual empowerment that uh, we empower the individual um, to take control of where to share the data, when to share it and where to stop sharing. And, and, and it can be just not just data, it, it can be the land data and everything. So it's it's very broad uh, definition. And then it has to be important it has to be portable so that um, 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 if the people move around the the, uh, the village or, or the, the mountain or if somehow sometimes um, in bad news if they have to move from other province to another province because of the uh, the government's um, migration um, post policy then they should be able to transfer those data uh, as they want and in, and then it has to be transparent and accountability so that um, um, the, the people who, who has control and, and sharing it to the other person um, should be able to see what's being shared and what it's what the data is being used. So it, it shouldn't be just um, like um, Piruan has said, um, it, it shouldn't be just for the profit of business, but for the uh, community. And then last, it's interoperability. So uh, um, we believe in open source and then everyone can has their own uh, version and then you should be able to share uh, in, interoperably without any problems. And um, and because of this, um, what I find is um, basically from, from my own experience of these past two years um, that, uh, that, that that I concentrate on the, uh, the my data work and also learning little bit by little bit of how the, uh, how, how, how I can help with the indigenous person. 
um, I find that um, this for P might, might, might be very useful. For example, the um, uh, the public-private people partnership uh, is uh, when, when we kind of translate it, it becomes uh, the legislation. So uh, the government themselves has to have a very good um, regulation to protect and punish um, whoever is, is not doing uh, ethically. And then the corporate, like um, enterprise, uh, they shouldn't be just going there and, and exploit the uh, citizens or the in indigenous people. They should be there to produce um, responsible business. It's kind of like um, how to en enforce SDGs and ESG so that um, the corporate can, can also earn money by improving this area while they can provide real ethical um, uh, services to the or, or advice to the uh, indigenous community. And the citizens, of course, the, um, the indigenous person themselves, um, they have to be able to know what's wrong or what's good for them so that they can demand human-centric design um, by themselves instead of being tell do this and that and then accept it 100 percent and then um, in order to do that we need community or ngos help uh, for example i've been working with um open development cambodia for for for, for two years and i, I helped them with the um, the workshop uh, for online children's safety and also with the my data community we also help people to learn um data literacy to improve uh, and raise awareness of of what we can do um, to to advise the government and and the uh, and the um, uh, corporate. So um, uh, to make it short, um, actually this is the the, the, the uh, photographs here. It's uh, my last trip in June that um, I help um, ODC um, on, on a workshop in the in in uh, CM Rip. Uh, so we asked um, eighteen student uh, children from twelve to sixteen. To come to to our workshop and then we kind of close it in so that they only uh, meet with the professional and then we separate the adults or the parents uh, for example the parents or the teachers into another group so that we kind of discuss uh, what they can do and what they want for the internet and then uh, because it's in it's in cambodia so we kind of translate our english question into karma so next time in november i'll be doing the same workshop uh, for, for the indigenous group so uh, in that case, hopefully someone will translate it into the local language for me. And, and the thing that I learned from this um, um, discussion or workshop, it's um, actually um, for, for the parents. Sometimes um, they didn't know that they, they don't have the consent of the children. Uh, for example, if, if they take photographs of, of the child, um, the, initially the, 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 the children is very happy. But then once they see the, uh, the parents sending the photo to, to, to Facebook or Instagram, then they become upset because um, even for children, they, they kind of learn that uh, it's not good to send the photo unattended to, to the internet. So uh, the parents and the children has to close the gap of this um, digital literacy. And that's what um, ODC or, or community can help by um, providing analog or digital um, workshops to them. And uh, the other thing is um, um, probably because children learn much faster than us, so the parents, instead of just giving their, their children the, the, the cell phone as the pacifier, and they should be able to learn what's going on with the, with the technology and then be able to help out or listen to what's going on with, with the children's uh, playing and, and then to help them out uh, uh, with an open um, open conversation. Because most of the time uh, when things happen, the children are so afraid and they don't want to talk to the children or the teacher. Um, so that's why um, we, have, uh, uh, oh, we have a we have a um, um, community that can help the, the, the children. They, they can report uh, any kind of um, um, online abuses or physical abuses. And also, um, there's a, a shocking figure that um, in the COVID era, um, things happen in the physical, they kind of change to online. So there's more online uh, abuse to children um, um, day by day. And and it's not just uh, in, in Cambodia or any other developing country or the global south. It's actually in, in every, everywhere in Japan or in, in Europe. So um, we have 21.7 million um, online child abuse like worldwide in 2021. So uh, last but not least, um, actually, so what kind of things that we provide in the workshop? It's um, um, we have several questions. First, we come, we come up with uh, some kind of comfortable questions that ask uh, whether they, they use YouTube to learn anything or they can tell us what they like about YouTube or what they don't like about YouTube, and then what they want to be the um, the, the most perfect 
application they want uh, to to play around. And then um, uh, for Cambodia, we we kind of insert one extra question about um, and some kind of a checklist that uh, whether uh, some people old, much older than them will it's it's asking them to 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 share photos or to share a message every day or whatever. So that's kind of be a kind of an alarm that um, they can tell whether they are they are being the target of grooming, which is uh, the, the action of of the older adults um, trying to lure the children to 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 provide um, uh, sexual abuse um, actions. So with this, um, we finally kind of usually if we have time, then uh, we have this kind of thing that how we can help them. For example, we'll ask um, what kind of perfect application do you want so that it, it will allow you to ask for help um, uh, as soon as possible or, or whatever. So all these things, um, it's analog, but if you kind of turn it around so that if it's just some kind of a um, um, digital technology, then then whether this database should should be in the uh, in Cambodia or in, the, in your own country, um, or should it be in somewhere else that no one can touch it, or it should it be some somewhere in your in your cell phones that um, only you can can unlock it and then share it anytime you want. So those are the things that uh, we kind of tackle, and then I would like to help the uh, in in the future um, in the future workshops. I would like to help the children and also the uh, the parents, also the engineer. Um, to do more um, technical stuff instead of uh, the, the analog one. So th those are the things that uh, I I'm doing um, um, regarding the indigenous um, um, community. And that's all. I I'll give the floor back to you, Peru. Thanks, Dixon. It's extremely valuable work um, that you're doing there and supporting some of those indigenous communities. Um, unfortunately, we have not heard back from Juliana. Um, so I'm just... <laughs> I'm assuming her connection is is um, not stable at the moment. But if anyone has any questions for either Piruan or or Dixon, please please do feel free to raise your hand um, or jump in, ask a question. If there are no questions, then I have a question to ask the presenters. I, I heard very strongly uh, between the two presenters that there's there's a really strong emphasis on Indigenous identity in relation to their ability to self-govern and manage their own data and information systems. And yet there seems to be a disconnect with the digital space um, and, and those spaces that facilitate um, and allow persons to control their data and information. And so language came out very strongly um, as a barrier. And to what extent do you think that that is something that is absolutely necessary to, to be able to overcome some of the issues? And, and to what extent do you think it is possible? Um, why don't, Piruan, why don't you answer that question first? Because you have to run off shortly. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, uh, when when we talking about indigenous, so there are different like uh, layers, not that you are how to say uh, suffering with, and you know like uh, most of the information that is being produced about us or for us to access is really challenging. We speak more than uh, four thousand languages, no? So maybe. It's also not easy to tackle on it, but at least uh, if uh, there are the support on the, how to say, uh, provide the technical support or uh, kind of like simplify the information, translate this thing um, into the different form of the knowledge. That also may, may help the people to aware uh, before I before they they going to post something those uh, when they're resting no for the people to, to understand and i think this is need need the partnership and networking with different organizations who are having the different expertise so app as the uh, as the organization and the movement of the people uh, we we able i mean we can do on in terms of simplify or like helping to circulate the information for our indigenous people but we need the partnership of 
those expert people and those who are really aware what are the digital platform can really benefit and also negative impact to our people. So those lens, I think, uh, people from the outsider. And I think also we have to raise the awareness, not only the Jina people, but also uh, the stakeholder, other stakeholder, the state, business, academic, or media, because uh, in some sense, you you holding something about our knowledge. And I think you also need to know what is the implication when, when you want to use or when you to want to produce those things and and whether it will be benefit or negative to the people. And that's why this framework will help to guide not only us, but also to communicate with the uh, outsider. What are the things that you should respect and follow you know, as a principle to respect our, our rights? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pirawan. Uh, Dixon, I think consent comes out really strongly in that response that Pirawan gave, and it's especially tr for children, right? Because children don't necessarily always have the agency to to provide that consent. Mm -hmm. So, how how are you working through these these issues? Yeah. So, so um, in in my data, we have this group um, co-led by um, Paula Bello, and uh, it's my data for children. Um, actually, in later hours, uh, she will be having a, um, a a discussion panel with the UNICEF. So basically, we we first ask for UNICEF guidance uh, for how to make it comfortable for the children, and then later, and the other thing would be um, uh, we always want to um, provide much simpler things that for the, for, for the, even even for the children or parents to know. So there will be. No, very long. There won't be any long messages that explain how to do this and that, and then basically like, yes. Otherwise, you you can work. So it has to be very straightforward, and and I think that's the the things that that can only help to to uh, to help anyone easily understand what's consent and and when to share and when to take it back, and um, to to add to um, um, besides language, what what other things would be the problem? I, I think it's. Um, uh, slowly, the, the enterprise is getting getting used to uh, um, responsible business. So, um, what what they what they previously found that if there's anything that doesn't make money or financially, they don't want to implement. So that's why you can never have um, special software that uh, which is already available for, for the normal people or for indigenous community. But later on, now because of the SDG targets and everything, um, some some enterprises are, are developing global responsible business uh, with some kind of definition. So for example, I'm, I'm SDG 9 enabler. So in, in my case, I try to push the enterprise of, of my own company to do more social impact and then to ask them to give me resources so that I can develop free open source software um, for, for, for anyone who can who want to use it and who want to learn it so, so that they can make their own. So that's the only things that you can really spread um, the words and then have the indigenous community build their own um, things that they want and, and the things that they really understand that, that benefits them. So that, that, that's all I have. Thank you, Dixon. I think that there's there's a lot to unpack there in terms of not only just government um, governing structures, but also how various stakeholders contribute towards um, ensuring Indigenous data rights, but also to be able to ensure that enterprise and benefit sharing is equalised across mm. across every every network. And in in your perspective, how do you see that um, that public private and people partnership negotiation working within this sector? Uh, Pirwan or Dixon? Uh just to share like what what I have seen or experienced like uh, it's not done in the such way of the respecting or acknowledging the the knowledge holder or the one who own the data because mostly what we see uh, that's why I share in the beginning like the misinformation misuse of our data misuse of our knowledge or sometimes uh, those benefit is go directly to the one who extract those knowledge and without uh, sharing to the community or even giving the, the credit. 
the without any consultation so the i would say that the free prior of informed consent has not applied to that and uh, i have there are some uh, i think there are some good company also that try try to initiate those process but in Wiley is still really few. So I think those things had to encourage like the private sector uh, accountability. You know? uh, there are the business and human rights framework, those things, like what are the, the things that the private company should know and understand. And I think uh, with this uh, framework, I think maybe the community people and the other stakeholders, they can learn and study and how to engage and have the proper uh, consultation or dialogue together by uh, keeping the principle of the, the how say the indigenous knowledge, data sovereignty, this one can be one tool to, to, to help now to engage with the outsider for, for both sides. And I hope like uh, the government also will take the action as the duty burial to protect uh, our right also over this thing so the other people will not uh, do harm to to our old people like that no yeah and for I'm me and in your response oh, sorry. <laughs> especially in relation to regulation i'm sorry can you say again i didn't I, i'm catch interested it. to hear your response in terms of a private sector approach yeah. on how to, how to yeah. protect data mm -hmm. sovereignty um for indigenous peoples so I, I actually, uh, for, for enterprise, we have we are bound by a lot of different compliance, and also uh, for, for for my company, we are currently we have um, uh, seven key areas that we want to concentrate on, and one of them is trusted society, and it it, it kind of cover everything from um, uh, doing AI ethics properly, providing ethical solutions, um, low risk, even high even if it's high risk, then it has to be um, ethical, and then doing um, business on the supply chain properly, so that um, we are not um, we are not helping anyone on um, uh, doing child labor or anything. And then, uh, because of the GDPR, actually really helps. That's why in in the uh, in, in the four piece legislation is quite important. If if there's no legislation, then uh, the, the the enterprise wouldn't implement their own compliance at at, at the uh, internal office. So so. Um, that's why for for enterprise, um, uh, I would say legislation is quite important to affect them. And then inside, uh, people like me who understand what's going on in, in the world and in, in the world trend, uh, we will be doing some kind of a bottom up um, um, promotion or movement to raise awareness that certain things shouldn't be done or, or how we can handle data properly. Uh, with consent and with with with, with um, ethical ethical practice, uh, that that will help um, help the enterprise to understand, to understand more and then to be able to provide proper solutions um, to have better uh, to have a better social impact. I'll give the floor back to you. Thank you, Dixon, and I I do apologize, everyone, for Juliana. We haven't managed to get her back on. <laughs> um online she was going to talk about alternative um, data governing structures for how communities are actually sustainably managing uh, information using techno uh, information using technology that would help to protect their lands and territories uh, her presentation will be available in the resources and i will ask her to to provide a short summary of what she was going to cover um, so apologies for that in terms of the indigenous data sovereignty, we did put a poll in the in the chat. Um, it's a simple question of have you heard of uh, indigenous data sovereignty before? And I'm not sure if you've had a chance to answer it, but if you have, um, can we make that poll uh, results live now to see? Um, yes. Uh, created. Can you please share the results? Oops. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, there's only one response. If you haven't responded to that poll, please 
um, <laughs> respond to it. Hopefully, um, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pirouan does have to leave um, early now because she's at, attending another event. Um, so thank you, Pirouan, for joining you, this Pirouan. conversation. And uh, the Indigenous Data Sovereign Framework, which has been uh, developed and designed by AOPP with their partners across Asia, will shortly be released. And it has been a long process of consultations. And although it has been challenging, predominantly because of language, much of the values and the principles on the way, um, the way they have developed the framework is very unique to Indigenous people's ways of thinking about the reciprocity of systems and ecosystems. And for me, I found that the most insightful and um, opening approach to how to think about systems. And when we talk about different governing structures and systems, the idea of collectivised systems came out really strongly in um, in those discussions and consultations with the Indigenous groups. So Dixon, when we think about that um, in terms of children's rights in a collectivized manner of communities and benefit sharing, how do you, how do you see that impacting the sector um, in terms of the way we're managing data for children um, in mm -hmm. collectivized ways and communities? Yeah, I, I think, um, it's kind of um, two, 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 two things that we have to be careful. So the first one is um, um, we, we, we should always keep in mind that um, they can always use they can always use the, uh, the, the apps or things without sharing the information so, so that it makes them more comfortable to answer to answer survey or to answer um, whatever data that they want to put in there uh, more with trust and, 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 and if, if 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 those things are not shared, then they will put in more um, correct uh, or more precise informations. And then, um, if when 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 the time comes and then they they really want to share it to uh, to to benefit themselves, for example, um, um, to share the grades so that they can have some comments on how to um, what what kind of topics they want to check. What they want to take in in high school, whatever. If something like that, then it should be a very safe platform that allows them to share the data and then being able to share, not share the data anytime they want. And then when they share the data, it, it should be like um, um, minimized so that um, their, their their own identity won't be able to identify identified. And then it can be inside coincide into a pool of data that kind of give them um, kind of um, uh, statistics of on average um, you have this and that but uh, it should never be able to from that average information go back and trace all the way back to pinpoint okay this is Dixon who, who answered these questions so um, mm -hmm. for, for us we have to be really careful about data minimization and also uh, and the anonymization so and, and for people who design those system just make sure you don't want to ask all the questions you want. You want to ask the most uh, variable questions you want to, to get mm -hmm. the data from. Don't don't just ask for some things that um, you think may be available or may be useful later. Because I've seen a lot of people practicing, they just ask everything, like 100 different entries, but then mm -hmm. they might only use one entry, right? And, and then for the rest of them, the 99, they put somewhere and then when it get lost and then it will be, um, uh, misused by any anyone who, who targets the children. So just practice minimization of data, then it, it will help everyone. That, that's my, my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great advice. And I, I think that applies also to Indigenous communities um, around the globe in terms of data minimization. Um, we have to wrap up now. And I do thank you, Dixon and Juliana, who was here shortly both previously, um, and Pirawan. Thank you so much for an insightful discussion. And I do hope, um, according to these polls, that 50%, almost 50% had not heard of Indigenous data sovereignty before. So I do hope to help um, raise awareness around these frameworks and principles in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank have, you. have a nice day. Bye-bye.